oil companies were really interested in having fuels all be thought of as energy, because then it's harder to say, well, if oil has this problem, this political problem, then we should go to, for example, at the time, nuclear or uh, these other fuel possibilities. Whereas if everything is thought about as energy, then if you lose oil, you lose energy. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Kara Daggett. Kara is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Virginia Tech, where she researches feminist political ecology. Kara joined me to discuss heteromasculinity and how to build feminist energy systems. This is such a fantastic episode, replete with knowledge, with musings, with concepts, with philosophy, with politics, all of our favorite topics on this show. We discuss how sexism is imbued in our exploitative and extractive fossil-fueled economy, that sexist beliefs justify how work and activity is organised, and how this thinking has even found its way into the green movement. Cara talks about the relationship between individualism, freedom, and this obsession with free energy, with how we use our energy, with fuel. She explains when life as energy became a concept in the 19th century. And how that concept today relates to our linear relationship with our world and ourselves. Kara explains how energy as a concept is actually very new, revealing how the oil industry lobbied for the term energy to be used in order to maintain their relevance during the oil crisis in the 70s. We talk about the anxiety of entropy in a masculinized linear world and how a feminist energy system would recognize and appreciate diffused energy, even if it cannot be put to useful work. We talk about the pluralism of feminism, and Kara reveals three spheres in which we can build out policies that represent a feminist energy transition by valuing care, education, health, the areas of life which have been feminized and thus undervalued. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Cara, I'm so excited to speak to you about your work, honestly. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Yeah, it's my pleasure. So I almost don't know where to start because everything that you work on is so interesting. So I suppose, how did you come on to this topic? Because I know you uh, wanted to be a medical student at one point, or you were a medical student. Oh, yes. That's that's deep history. Um, <laughs> yeah, I studied science as an undergraduate, um, biochemistry, and I think I was always interested in um, global injustice. And in I started medical school um, and I ended up taking a leave of absence and I didn't go back and I started graduate work in these bigger political questions. I, I became interested in why. Um, why things are like this. And I didn't start out um, in studying politics. I didn't start out in environmental themes. But I think given my background in science, it was probably inevitable that Mm. I would be interested in that. Mm. So I think it's helpful because part of a big, if I were to say, you know, the big through line of my work is to try to communicate to the public that things like energy are not as technocratic as they are often made out to be Mm -hmm. handled by experts who are 
you know about engineering and and people don't often think that they have anything to contribute so i think it helps to have a science background so as not to from the beginning feel intimidated not that i'm an expert in energy engineering but um i think it's helpful to get over that first feeling of intimidation understood so let's start with the problem, petrol masculinity, and then we'll move on to uh, feminist energy systems. So okay. what is petrol masculinity? Petrol masculinity is a concept that I developed to make sense of what was happening in the far right in the U.S., but I think it um, is relevant beyond the far right. And the concept is trying to to point out the connection between sexism and uh, fossil fuel support or climate mm -hmm. denial. Both structurally, how sexism structures the world and the economy in a way that is very much connected to how the earth is conceived and used, including this access to intensive energy. But also... Um, emotionally and um, affectively in terms of understanding the way people respond to climate change and climate politics, not always through cost-benefit analysis or um, price signals, but also there are cultures and ways of life and whole belief systems wrapped up now in access to fossil fuels and um, and fossil fuel technologies. Right, okay. Um, so sexism as a cultural belief, say, or a cultural way of organizing uh, impacts or defines um, our current energy system? Well, I think the sexism was not... Um, Sexism was not invent was not you know caused by fossil fuels. I think mm -hmm. uh, it has a longer history. And it is, yes, a, cult a cultural belief system, but more importantly, perhaps it's a material system in the sense that mm. beliefs about sex be sexist beliefs help to justify the way work and activity are organized. Um, so a lot of my research is connecting our beliefs about our practices and beliefs about work to the way that we value and think about energy. And by we, by the way, I mean Americans or Westerners. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this kind of sort of Western industrial and colonial system that, that really with fossil fuels takes root in the 19th century. So sexism is not just, you know, a belief about women or, or um, trans and queer people. It's the way that those beliefs then have real effects in the world in terms of what kinds of work are valued and who's doing what work. Fascinating. And could you speak more to that then? What, what kind of work is valued <laughs> under a, <laughs> in a sexist world? Um, so uh, I would say there's a the way I would describe it as productivism as a as a um, belief system. So this approach to energy and to work as um, what can be productive, and that means a very specific thing in in a capitalist system. It means um, what can be made to increase in profit. Um, so what kinds of work are conducive to that? And that's not to say that that's the only work that is happening in the world or that that's what's interesting, right? There's actually a lot of care work, um, so-called care work and other kinds of work to just um, support our everyday life that mm -hmm. are really necessary, but when they're undervalued, they don't get the same kind of um, celebration or treatment. And I think we even see this in the emphasis on green jobs. Um, these are often uh, narrowed to manufacturing or, or high-tech kinds of jobs. Um, 
And, you know, feminine, not just me, but many feminists are arguing that we need to start thinking about other kinds of work that can also be quote unquote green, like um, education, health, um, parenting, elder care, um, cleaning, cooking, and so on and so forth. And these things are often poorly paid, unpaid, um, many of them performed by women and people of color. Right. Okay. So, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is so interesting, isn't it? Because it speaks to the green growth paradigm um, that is coming in to almost attempt to substitute the fossil fuel economy. And what a lot of scholars are warning against is if we don't change our, you know, attitudes and belief systems and these structural problems that are also caused by capitalism, um, then we will continue to have extractivism and exploitation, but just using a, a different tech in order to do that, because we're not taking the opportunity to produce a, a care economy. Right. Yes, and absolutely mm -hmm. the peak of growth. And I think it's important to recognize that people are attached to growth um, for certainly because there are people who profit quite a lot from it or get certain entitlements and privileges, but also because even our understanding of what it means to be free or um, uh, dreams and visions of what a good life means are attached to the way work is currently organized. And it's very, it's very tightly bound to the way we think about how much energy we need and what kinds of energy are valuable or not valuable. Okay. Could you speak more to that? I think what fossil fuel systems did, again, is not cause sexism, but rather um, make possible this relationship to energy as something that seemed almost amazingly bountiful, um, mm -hmm. something that could be somehow without limits, even though in the 19th century you did have people starting to warn about coal exhaustion or wonder what happens when fossil fuels are gone, you still had um, this economy develop around the sense of limitless expansion. Um, and this um, idea that freedom could come through freeing our, the constraints that the earth posed to putting the world to work. Um, and fossil fuels really help with this kind of astronomical sense of power, help to make that fantasy seem possible, this dream almost of a free energy. And I think you can see that mapped on to sometimes to solar and wind, that one day we will actually have free energy, you know, energy that is somehow unbound from life and the earth and death and decay and all these things. And I think this is really connected to an understanding of freedom that's about this kind of individual independence and liberation from, um, from having to depend upon other people and mm -hmm. having to depend upon the earth. Um, and it's a very masculinist understanding, again, that is... Um, not just undervaluing, but also um, wanting to transcend uh, care relations and work and, and all these things that are feminized. It's not to romanticize care. I think there is a danger there, too, um, because a lot of so-called care work is really dull and dirty and not always enjoyable. It's more about how do we better um how do we better value that and how do we distribute it in a way that is more fair mm. so um i think what's at the root of this problem around both energy and this notion this kind of hyper masculinist notion of freedom is that they're fantasies right mm. there isn't actually free energy and there's not <laughs> a life that's not dependent upon other people and things. 
That is so interesting. It makes me think of um, Plato's concept of absolute ideals, you know, and almost this moment in Western philosophy where there was, it was set into our, you know, cultural tropes that um, human sort of, <laughs> human expression or human destiny is to transcend the earth and is to get to, you know, the eternal place, whether that be heaven or any sort of um, understanding of, of an afterlife as if, the earth was not as if we are better than nature um, and there's something else that is waiting for us at which point we will be home um, and unbound from the limitations of biology you know eternal um, and well I suppose just eternal yeah yeah and escaping the body um, mm -hmm. and and that then that's that sort of breeds this connection between women and nature as these um really embodied figures uh and this binary between you know that somehow it is women then associated with cyclical bound and constrained nature and we need to transcend mm -hmm. that um that yes you're right it's a deep it's a deep tradition in western thought um, and you can certainly trace it back to, to ancient Greece. <laughs> and I'm sure further back than that, I'm sure it didn't all kick off in ancient Greece, but that's probably my uh, furthest back reference point for, for this kind of thinking. Yeah, and it's um, worth saying, you know, that there are other ways of thinking about energy. Um, so I think what's helpful in identifying energy as a as a western philosophy is to parochialize it to understand this is one value system mm -hmm. and there are others there are other philosophies that have existed and that can exist um and i it so part of what I, I have a book called The Birth of Energy that looks at the science of energy in the 19th century. That's when energy is supposedly discovered. And I think one of the dangers there is that because it's so associated with physics, it, there's this slippage between um, the hard facts of science and this Western understanding of work so that it seems like this is a universal truth. Mm. I, I so in some of my work I try and like parse between different words that we use for the same thing to try and highlight like well here's the ideology that we're putting onto something so and, and one of the things that I focus on is the difference well the fact that there is energy um but the word that we typically use for it is fuel in our day-to-day -day lives and that sort of like it creates a, a binary or differentiation between the fact that I mean, every living, everything is is made of energy and is um, using energy all the time. But it's as if there is this sort of other thing that was uh, put into the world or put into the Earth's crust, for example, with fossil fuels that we are allowed to draw upon in order to fuel ourselves, and that creates like this other this other othering again uh, that separates us from from nature and from the fact that we are also just you know, well, living organisms that have energy within us and everything is energy in the world. Yeah, and the, the, what interested me in, in this book I wrote about energy was that this way of understanding life as energy and everything composed as energy, I expected that to be as old as ideas about matter or other kinds of ancient concepts. And actually, this understanding is really in the 19th century is when energy is thought of that way. It's just a poetic, rarely used term before that, um, not a scientific term. And not to say there weren't um, ideas about life force or, or change over mm -hmm. time, but they weren't... Um, they weren't organized all together in this one scientific knowledge. And what's interesting is that the science of energy is born out of engineers trying to make coal-fired steam engines more efficient. 
So this was kind of an aha moment for me. Like, it's not that science is true or untrue. It's just there were so, there were these interests in efficiency and profit making that were part of um, of this metaphor. It really is metaphoric of energy because energy itself, like you said, it's not actually a thing. It's a it's a concept. It's a set of calculations in in science for um, trying to track change over time. Mm. And fuel. So, for example, fuel is a thing, but mm. what we call fuel energy, we're thinking about it a certain way. We're thinking about how do we use it over time, yeah. and so expectations about efficiency and doing work with it become really important to these first scientists. And and this is where you get the um, cultures mapping onto the science itself, or the way the science gets used in the world. Oh, that's fascinating. So it's almost, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's almost as if because we come to think of it in terms of energy, which is useful work and, you know, tracking change over time, there's almost a an assumption baked into that, that we therefore have to use that which is available. Um. Yes, and I don't think the assumption, though, comes necessarily from the science because actually the science of energy gets really weird really fast and you get into relativism and you have the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy. Basically, mm -hmm. like things fall apart. Energy tends to decay. So it's not like the science necessitates this understanding. But what happens is... um engineers are really interested in energy and use energy and that's the way they think about it they think they define energy sometimes energy is defined as the ability to do work but mm -hmm. actually that's not a great definition because energy can also be really diffuse and not capable of work so um so yeah it's really it's fun to watch these words and concepts travel back and forth between the lab and government. And even more interesting is um, it's really not until the 1970s that you get things like the Department of Energy or energy um, thought of it as this political object that means all fuels. Mm. That is really around what is often called the oil crisis, which, you know, many scholars have said it wasn't really necessarily a crisis in the way it's thought about. But of the 1970s, this concern about oil and um, in part, oil companies were really interested in having fuels all be thought of as energy, because then it's harder to say, well, if oil has this problem, this political problem then we should go to, for example, at the time, nuclear or uh, these other fuel possibilities. Whereas if everything is thought about as energy, then if you lose oil, you lose energy. Um, oh, I see. Yes. Oh, that's... God, they're good at what they do, they're aren't so they? Good. There's even evidence in the 70s that the oil companies were funding environmental groups that were critiquing nuclear power because nuclear was i mean nuclear was a really viable alternative there were these you know there were real fears that oil was going to lose its standing and energy is one of the almost like a pr thing you know like let's have oil count as energy right okay so by by giving everything a name, by lumping everything into one category, and it, it becomes the energy crisis rather than a crisis of a specific fuel yes. um, that is causing problems to planet or to people. And it maintains their relevance then. I think that was the ploy. I mean, it's not to say you shouldn't think about oil as energy. It's just when you look at what's happening politically, that's the moment where you do... You know, before that, for example, in the U.S., um, the management of, for example, fossil fuels or nuclear were in separate institutes, separate agencies. They weren't all there wasn't a Department of Energy. Right. So it's just interesting to think about, well, why? 
why does that shift happen? You know? So yes, what you just said, I think is, is partly the intention of, of, I'm sure there's other, um, you know, I'm sure an explanation could be too, well, it's a crisis and therefore these things have to all be managed together and strategically thought about. But certainly oil companies were interested in having that happen. <laughs> so mm. that they're part of that. Right. Okay. And just before we move on to work, because there's something I want to tease out with you. Um, what do you think the impact then? Could you could you speak to this whole this framing of energy as as a life force, okay. life as energy that happened in science? How do you think that that led then to the oil industry recognizing that as sort of the words that needed to be deployed or the category that needed to be deployed in order to say maintain their relevance? Although, as you say, I'm sure the <laughs> the reality is a little bit more nuanced than that narrative. Um, is it that they then become the masters of life force, which keeps the world going, so to speak? I think it just connects to this notion that vitality and freedom and life as valued in a capitalist Western industrial system are dependent upon oil is the, is the sort of message. And mm. that's true, I think. I mean, I think right now, yeah. Yeah, an energy transition is going to have to also be a transition in the way we think about work, freedom, what is the good life. Mm. Um, so in a way, I almost think we need to um, borrow that, that strategy from oil and remind ourselves that there's lots of different kinds of energy. And if we're going to have a department of energy, why don't we also think about exhaustion and um, overwork of people and ecologies, so on and so forth. Like, why not? Why just fuels, you know? Mm. So let's talk about the different kinds of work and work that's feminized and, and masculinized. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe perhaps also that the relationship of the word work to energy, you know, mm -hmm. useful work. Uh, which I just think is such an astonishing phrase. And, you know, we could talk about for days, useful work. Yes. Um, so if work is va valued as the kind of work that um, changes things over time, which becomes known in a capitalist economy as productivity, is that perhaps why we undervalue care work, which isn't about actually change, but it's about stewardship. It's about maintenance. It's about management or, you know, especially in care. Um, palliative care, palliative work that allows people to, you know, move towards death. That's not particularly productive in a capitalist system. Do you think that there's a link between this framing of uh, energy as also useful work and that which can be changed over time? Oh, absolutely. And, and so... You're right. This phrase useful work is fascinating, especially when it comes in to physics language or engineering language. Um, so, for example, when you think about entropy, which, again, mm -hmm. is the tendency for energy to diffuse. And the effect of that diffusion is often described as being less capable of doing work or doing useful work. But these are, I mean, these notions of what is good and bad energy or use, like the the sort of um, almost moral language that comes around understandings of entropy are really human-centered because, um, I mean, for example, composting or death, decay, Obviously, ecologists know that these things are part of bigger cycles. Um, on the other hand, a lot of um, scientists in the 19th century and still today with entropy started to think really cosmic about something called heat death. Like this means that things fall apart on a cosmic scale. The sun will burn out and everyone's going to die. I mean, it led to this real 
sort of tragic anxiety that then underlies a colonial and capitalist system that, you know, in the 19th century is already going. So fossil fuels don't really create that system. They just, in a way, accelerate and intensify it. But I think this language around energy is really, when we think about the urgency to put things to work and productivity, I think entropy, the sense that things do fall apart, and that as being a moment of anxiety rather than um, having a different philosophy or culture around death and our relationship to the earth, I think that is that is the emotional um, underpinning. Let's let's talk about entropy then, because. Right. And obviously, as I'm sure anyone listening has heard, already heard in this conversation, I am also not a physicist, uh, but I'm kind of obsessed with entropy and I understand it very, very little. Um, but so if entropy is energy diffusion, it becomes less and less capable of doing work. Um, and higher entropy is sort of more randomness in a system. Um, but equally, energy cannot be made or destroyed. So it's diffusion, but it's not, it's not energy that's going away. It's energy that is cyclical, surely, in the same way that one day my you know, biological body will die, <laughs> decay, um, but all the energy held within this uh, biological organism will be diffused back into a far more complex system that is you know, our biosphere and is the entire planet and then the solar system and you know, as far out as you want to go. Um, so what can, what can feminist ideology teach us about recognizing the, the cycles of energy and, and entropy and to pull us away from this kind of like, I don't know, uh, linear obsession with mastering and domination and extraction that we seem to be living in as a culture? Wow, those are um, those are great questions. Yeah. So, f first of all, what you said about entropy is is really gets to the heart of the paradox of the science of energy, which is that mm -hmm. if energy is so tightly bound to doing work, um, like you said, energy doesn't when it dissipates or diffuses, it's still there. <laughs> mm. Even if it's not, work is not necessarily going to do as much work. And so it really challenges um, our, it, it's a reminder that the simplistic understanding of energy is not reflective of the complexity of the science itself, um, which is why theoretical physicists are much more interesting, you know, they, <laughs> they don't have it's really engineering that that gets kind of obsessed with work and efficiency and so on. And then your second question about how does feminism help us? Um, well, I'll say, first of all, I don't think feminism is the only um, way to undo these ideas. Um, and I think there are a lots. And I, for me, part of a feminist praxis or philosophy is actually pluralism, is to recognize mm -hmm. that um, diversity in thinking and living and being is actually a really wonderful, life-giving thing that we should celebrate. So that even includes that there are not, there are ways of um, challenging these systems that maybe don't forefront feminism. Um, especially, you know, there's anti-racist work, but of course there's black feminist work that is, that is, um, at the forefront here. There's indigenous work. There's lots of different philosophical and historical, um, ways of being. So I want to start with that, but the, mm -hmm. what feminism is really helpful for is it, recognizes this division of the world into binaries, work, waste. Um, 
idleness and productivity, um, death and life, um, the body, the mind, all of these divisions um, are related to how power is organized. And it's this very tight justification system with real effects in the world. And I think feminism is helpful to make that connection between these understandings and power. And then to, with that understanding, um, I think have, a, have better ideas about overcoming those, the way power is organized. And again, it's not to romanticize the other term of the binary and to say, oh, well, then it's all about idleness and care and rest. Um, because I think the binary itself has divided the world artificially. So feminism for me is, is just helpful because wherever I see language that um, is gendered and... Um, representation that is gen very gendered um it's a sign it's kind of like a little and my antenna goes up what's going mm -hmm. on here um mm -hmm. uh and asking these deeper questions what kinds of understanding of the world are at work here to make it necessary for us to feminize this or that or racialize this or that understood so then let's talk quickly how we power organized what can feminism <laughs> reveal to us about that i mean talk about it quickly <laughs> that's a good way to go how is power organized um <laughs> i think things especially um race and gender in particular but also geographically global north global south ideas these are all um systems that work to naturalize the way power is organized, which is essentially to make things that are very exploitative, extractive, and cruel and violent look like natural processes. So attaching them to bodies and things like sexual organs or skin color or where people live or, or the climate that they live in because we have these old 19th century ideas that like people who live in a hot climate are naturally lazy or this or that. So attaching it to these kind of physical um, material traits helps to naturalize things that are actually very political processes that are upheld by violence. Um, and I think for me, that's why when I try to imagine what a better energy transition would look like, it's really about having a wider sense of all of these different sites where labor is being exploited and extracted as relevant to making a transition, including in the sphere of reproductive labor, um, that those kinds of policies should be forefront in an energy transition plan, not just how many solar panels are we connecting to the grid. Could you, okay, could you repeat that for me? The kinds of policies that should be forefront? You said reproductive labor and... Yeah, so there's this um, wonderful Marxist feminist named Nancy Fraser who has... Um, uh, ma sort of helps map how power is organized. And she, is, and I like, sometimes I like to think with her on, on these other, like I said, other sites where labor is being exploited and extracted. And she categorizes them, of course, any category, the world is messy, but she categorizes them as um, reproductive labor, the state, which I might broaden to say empire and then the earth ecology the way that the earth is extracted from as if it's a free resource and then dumped into and so i for me thinking about feminist energy or a better energy system would be that those spheres are really important places for 
counting as relevant to energy and thinking about policies and transitions in those spaces as part of energy transition. So right now, energy transition is usually very technical about fuel. Um, and I That's think it's important yeah. to expand it. All right, let's go through them one by one. I'm fascinated. So <laughs> uh, reproductive labor, how would we put those kinds of policies? What kind of policies would they be? And what would the impact be on understanding an, an energy transition? Well, I'll give a specific example. Um, in the U.S., the Biden administration tried to put forward climate legislation. And very quickly, the legislation was separated into a hard and soft pack deal, like a hard and soft legislative package, which right away you can see there's gendered language going on. Um, and the soft, the so-called soft bill included what people termed as human infrastructure. And it included Ugh. like things about healthcare policy, education, childcare. And these were not, I mean, by European standards, these were not very radical policy proposals, but they were trying to move forward in making these more supported. Um, and I think what I'm saying, what I'm noticing here is how quickly that is jettisoned as this soft thing that could be separated. And that, that was destined for failure. So that very quickly was not going to happen. And the so-called hard bill, which was predominantly about technology, infrastructure, not that those things aren't important, but they were the hard bill that got bipartisan support and ended up passing. And that's a good thing. But um, I think we can see how right now it's very easy to say, well, education is irrelevant. So it's okay to take out this controversial thing so that we can pass the real thing that really matters, which is the hard bill. And even that language, it, yes, it is incredibly gendered. And it also suggests like the pliability of one thing, you know, the fact that it, it's perhaps not necessary, whereas that which is hard and fast needs to happen now. Um, it's very concrete and present for everybody. Yes. Mm, fascinating. So, so what you're saying is that reproductive labor, the kind of policies that fall under that are education, health, uh, care, and putting those at the front of center of our energy transition. Well, it would not only be a or force a transition in sort of cultural thinking, perhaps, or cultural belief systems. Um, but what? It would also reframe energy how? I think a big part of, so when we think, for example, about degrowth in the global north, so the need for um, the colonizing states to stop, to, liber to stop extracting from and keeping the global south down, and we think about the need for degrowth in these kind of energy intensive systems like the U.S., um, part of that is a cultural shift. And I think a lot of it has to do with what is meant by work and productivism. And um, to me, it's really important to frame degrowth. I, I mean, honestly, I think it's a bad word, degrowth. I, think it's, I know it's a translation in terms of the scholarship, but because it's always felt as a limit, as, as a constraint. And in some ways it is, but I think focusing on creating infrastructures of care that support people and take care of people and the earth are really important, not just materially, but emotionally and psychologically in terms mm -hmm. of um, how communities think about energy and each other and what um, how much energy people need. So I think if you say, well, you need to lose less energy, but also in the U.S., people are really vulnerable. Um, and even energy-intensive lives in the U.S., for many people, 
doesn't contribute a lot to well-being. And um, so I think there's a real need to take care of people in addition to transitioning with energy. So when we talk about moving towards um, moving towards using less energy that needs to come with uh, caring economies and infrastructures. Yeah, totally. Uh, to me, a, a, a transition is an opportunity for an abundance economy yes. or a, a well-being economy, absolutely, which prioritizes, <laughs> well, as you say, care, well-being, community, these things that if they if there were infrastructure in place, if they were supported by the state, if communities were enabled and empowered to do that, our lives quite automatically would be less energy um, intensive. Time spent with loved ones, uh, time to fix things in one's own home, time to build, time to create. Mm -hmm. uh, it means that you're not constantly dialed into the market economy to provide your needs. Because other things can meet those needs. Connection can meet those needs. Yes. Yes. And yeah. so I think, you know, often the public discourse around, say, the, the things in the soft bill in the U.S. are that these social justice ideas are somehow tacked onto the real thing, which is the hard stuff and the fuel. Um, as if, you know, the left is taking advantage of this moment by just adding these other th nice things they want. So I think it's really important to the message that you're expressing and that we're talking about, which is, no, these things are actually deeply relevant to our relationship to fuel. Um, and And I think probably necessary to sustainability in the future certainly to justice definitely i mean for me it's just about moving away from whatever linear narrative we've baked ourselves into or become baked into a recognition of the the cyclical nature of life of the temporal nature of, of human existence of biological existence um a sense of re-embedding in the earth, an embodiment of of policy and of life itself, rather than everybody sort of existing on this, like, I don't know, as these uh, codes in a marketplace yeah. that are measured for their productivity, yeah. essentially. I mean, that's all we are right now. And that's all that we are supported to be because the human body is extracted upon as well in order to produce wealth for and I'm not I mean who are we producing wealth for now honestly it's like a cup you know sometimes it seems like just a couple of people whose names are thrown around very very often certainly on Twitter yeah um, and it, I would love to sit them down and be like where do you think you're gonna go it's like wait, Mars. <laughs> well yeah but it's just what are you doing? What are you? What could you possibly be getting out of this with your own limitations? What well, limitations? But being an embodied human being as well, you know, what could you possibly be getting out of this to extract so much from billions of people around the world and the earth itself? I just, I just can't quite wrap my head around it. It's just absurd. It's laughably absurd. I think the situation that we've gotten ourselves into, except that it's killing people, and it's killing the planet. Yeah, it's it is absurd and I and I think what I'm interested in is that that we can see this and yet um and yet it continues and I think also that certainly there are elites who are quite self-consciously um you know, feeding oil PR and lies into public discourse and doing criminal, terrible things knowingly. At the same time, I'm interested in this public sense of attachment. And I think a lot of it comes out of anxiety because we, we are forced to live in a system where at any moment we could lose everything. We could not be able to feed our families. We could, 
losing your job really could be losing access to survival. And it creates this combination of um, desire and anxiety create this reactionary feeling um, on the far right, but also in a lot of the eco-modernist plans that, you know, that want to change fuel, but keep everything else the same. Yes. Yes. Although I'm not, to be honest, I'm not even sure what label they fall under now. I'm kind of like reticent to give them any equal label. I feel like it's just sort of, um, you know, a political movement of people that have been deliberately fed misinformation um, and believe that I don't know what they believe that <laughs> the world is fine as it is and we just need to swap out one thing for another. It's it's such a reduction of complexity to desire and anxiety, exactly as you were saying. Yeah, I mean it's you're right, it's a failure of information, probably a sort of not knowing about history, I think is a big part of it. Um mm. In the U.S., I don't know the U.K. education system, but we're having fights right now about mm. what U.S. history is and really important challenges to the narrative we tell about the role of the U.S. in the world. And I think part of it is this, that to take this more critical approach means coming to terms with the role of my state or region or family in the world is not what I thought it was. That's hard. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. Especially when people don't have a community to fall back onto for identity. Like yes. to live in such a hyper individualist state and then to say everything that you've thought about your history, which is ascribed to an ideological nation, is now wrong. And people aren't embedded in community that can look after one another. I mean, that is a recipe for civil war because it's such a psychological wound that's going to be inflicted and people will fight to have it not inflicted upon them. Yeah, especially when you have all the guns that um, that we have. It's quite a yeah. lot. It's quite a lot of guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and this, so, yeah I think the civil war, I mean, in some ways in the U.S., I mean, in many ways, this is a continuation of the Civil War that mm -hmm. all the wounds that um, were made and refused to be healed in terms of reconstruction um, and that were just allowed to fester and continue and intensify. Yeah, completely. There's one final thread I want to tease out with you. Um, and I suppose it goes into this binary of masculinity, femininity, mm -hmm. but with an awareness that feminism is about breaking down binaries. So there's there's a both in both. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, where was I? I think I was walking along a canal the other day and it just suddenly hit me that we, you know, we use this terminology of like patriarchy and there's this awareness that like patriarchy also hurts men and masculinity. It's not about the, you know, sex divide and all these kinds of things. Uh, but we live in like a very masculine or patriarchal world. And it suddenly hit me that like there must be something fundamentally um, incorrect about this expression of masculinity, because surely if masculinity were expressed in a way that was uh, in keeping or honoring with, you know, the relationship to the natural world or its relationship to other, then, you know, the world wouldn't be on the brink of collapse, essentially. The, the way the masculinity is expressed, is being expressed, must be fundamentally antithetical to what masculinity is, right? So that's one bit of it. And then... What I was thinking about is, okay, so if we're up against this kind of like perverted masculinity um, and there's huge movements, social movements around the world tackling it and, and, and different points of the branch, whether it's the climate movement, whether it's the anti-racist movement, whether it's the, the feminist movement. And obviously these things are fantastically, you know, coalescing. Um, if feminism 
is continued to be seen as this, you know, care, cyclical, um, soft part of the binary. How are we ever going to topple the power of a perverted masculine ideology? And where within feminism can we find whatever the both and of masculinity is to go up against power with the force that it needs? Because I suppose my concern is that when we see Okay, full disclosure, I just read How to Blow Up a Pipeline by Andrew Ma- by Andreas Malm, so I'm like fully in this. Okay. Um, but when we see sort of the ideologies that get peddled out, sometimes of like nonviolence or that, you know, love will heal all, it's a kind of almost like spiritual bypassing of the structural problems. And so what can feminism do to also recognize, I don't know, the... the <laughs> the yang of itself as well, the masculine that must reside within it in order to topple the perverted masculine that has so fundamentally rejected the, any sort of feminine, femininity, feminism, that we are on the brink of destroying our only home. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, that's really important to this idea that when you have a binary, it's, crucial not to just pick up the other side of the binary as the right thing and this often happens in um common assumptions about what feminism is so and even among some some feminist movements um because when women have been so closely associated in a certain society with certain activities and certain metaphors and words and ideas, then it it makes sense that there would be a movement to celebrate those and lift them up and remind everyone how important they are. And then you run that real risk that you buy into the essentialization of what femininity is. And I don't, by the way, I don't think there is any fundamental, I think masculinity and femininity are just are socio natural concepts like there is no natural um <laughs> you know grounding mm-hmm. of what these things mean that we can recover but i would really like that you pointed to yang because i think there are other philosophies of difference mm-hmm. that yin and yang is one or the Tao that think about difference not as either or but as Mm -hmm. one and the other and the other in one so that Mm -hmm. it's impossible to understand them um as separate Mm -hmm. and um that could be one one way to think about it and i think it's so exciting to me to watch what's happening among especially young people right now around ideas about gender, um, exploding categories, creating new ones. Um, These kinds of social experiments are really important. And and a lot of that is playing with and messing with this binary. And I think where that gets us materially is to recognize the soft things like care work, but not to then make them into these sacred icons to just count them and then consider them politically as important and in need of um, distribution and compensation and basically accounting for um, and not naturalizing onto certain people. So, yeah, I mean... I I also worry, I really love Andreas Malm's work um, and his book Fossil Capital was important to my work on the history of energy. I'm sympathetic to the feelings of um, frustration with pacifism or the way that um, the way that violence gets framed and understood. Um, but I also, sometimes I worry there, there's always a risk around notions of action and even violence that we discount things by feminizing them as too small or um, imp- impractical mm. or um, 
not as important or like the background conditions upon which we build. So I think the answer maybe is the yin and the yang, right? Like it's not, it can't just be one idea or strategy or the other. It's about how do we think of them always as this tension, one within yeah. the other. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a phrase that often comes up on the show is an ecosystem of thought, an ecosystem of action. It has to be plural. It has to be heterogeneous. It has to be diverse. Because also that's mm -hmm. the kind of world that we want to build, exactly as you said. Kara, I just heard your alarm go off, so I know Please. that we have to wrap up. We're so um, about that. No, that's all right. My final question for you is, who would you like to platform? Well, I would like to platform, um, you're, a, you're a journalist, right? Yeah. Yes, I would like to platform a journalist um, right. named Emily Atkin. A yeah. You know her? He did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We tweet. It's that, that, okay. that. Great. Oh. Great. Not to self-promote, but I was made aware of her because she shared my work. Um, and then I've joined her newsletter. And I just, I think investigative journalism is so important. And one of the ways that these fossil fuel systems get to do all this nasty PR work is because local news has, you know, is dying in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and. So I just am such a fan of all investigative journalists and would really like people to subscribe to Heated. Wonderful. Yes, I second that. I highly recommend it. I was in a meeting the other day, actually, um, with a bunch of media uh, professionals from the UK. And somebody said, you know, Emily Atkins Heated has probably done more for the climate movement and climate uh, journalism than all of the other elite press put together in the past five years. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, incredible. I'm glad Good yeah. for her. And it's, yeah. you know, I'm glad that she's, I don't know how it's, I don't know her, but, I, and I don't know how the business model is going. And it's, it's nice to see journalists trying to make it work. But I also wish she just, I'm sure she wishes that she just had stable kind of material support. But yes. Yeah. Kara, thank you so much. This has been delightful. Thank you. It really, what a wonderful conversation. I loved all the oh, philosophical digressions. Um, and I like, I love your website too. I, I checked it out and you have some great stories. And, um, you know, when I teach about this, I really like to have resources like this because it, it speaks to the students and it helps translate some of the research in a more engaging way. So um, oh, glad to have found you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's just amazing to hear. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.